a thousand monkeys descend on their lunch. The potatoes are free and served buffet style. It's not a convention of Japanese macaques. They're here as a cabaret, entertainment for people. The troops' population increased because the living is easy. They've become a city of monkeys, strangers in a place of plenty, looking after number one. Like us, they are intelligent primates, quick to learn, but also quick to exploit. The world of wild macaques is far less crowded. and intelligence is applied to survival. Anything they can eat, they will eat. Macaques have conquered all Asia by such opportunism. Beachcombing turns up all kinds of goodies. and the youngsters copy their parents at the seaside. Socially, macaques live in groups of mixed sex and with a defined home range and a strict hierarchy among both males and females. There are fish coming in on the tide. Soon they'll all be well fed for the day. In this complex society, where everyone knows their place, grooming is more than a hygienic pastime. There are rank orders being established and maintained. They have expressive faces, which together with postures and gestures and calls, they use in a subtle language understood by all. No one misses anything. They learn from each other. A macaque once discovered how to eat limpets and soon the group copied and now regularly exploits this rock cafe with its endless protein supply. And they'll keep other groups away. This one's discovered they're a little looser underwater but more hazardous to reach. Macaques don't like sand on their food and have learned to wash it off in the sea. So intelligent are they and quick to learn that people have exploited them. In southern Thailand, this big-tailed macaque doesn't have to walk on two legs. The owner just likes it that way. The monkey is also going to work. The man has trained the monkey from birth to select and pick ripe coconuts. It's a simple task, just twist and off it will come. But the monkey has also learned to judge ripeness by color. And the monkey will have to pick them up, about 800 coconuts a day. Hard labor under the sun. We can hardly complain when such intelligent animals make monkeys out of us. And some macaques in India are doing just that. At the Durga temple in Varanasi, macaques enjoy holy status and are protected. But no one has to bring them an offering of food. So they've turned to crime. These are monkey muggers and they select their victims intelligently. The women and the children are an easier touch. If food were to be offered, the macaques would become a picture of holy innocence.
Into the sunlight of a brief Arctic summer in Russia struggles a snow goose chick. And the first object it sees in here is its mother. To all these goslings, snug in their thick down, that first sight of their parents is the most important moment of their young lives, bonding them to the adults. When mother and father move, they'll follow, pulled by the invisible chains of the natural process of imprinting. Chicks peck instinctively for food soon after leaving the egg. Only six hours later, they're ready to begin the 50-mile walk to an estuary. The journey will take several weeks. By the time they arrive, the sea ice will have melted. Imprinting will keep them close by the adult birds, where they can feed safely as they travel. The chicks have never seen water before. They have not had instruction in swimming, but they follow their parents fearlessly to the sea. The new forest in southern England. Other chicks are starting life here, high in the trees. A mandarin duck has raised her brood in a tree hollow nest. Like the snow geese, they are imprinted on mother, so must follow, no matter what befalls them. Their fluffy down parachutes them to a soft landing in a new world. For a few moments, it's raining ducklings. Mandarin ducks are birds of the Far East. These have escaped from captivity into the wild. Now they're at home in one of Britain's most ancient forests. Obedient to their parents' calls, they take to the water for the first time in their lives. The parents raised a brood here last year and will return again and again to this area. Easy living for ducks is anywhere that people are, by a lake or river. These ducks have little fear of their human benefactors. Thousands of years ago in China, when rice was first being grown, Ducks were brought under human control. Today, here in Bali, the same technique is in use. When these ducks hatched as chicks, the first object they were allowed to see was not their real mother, but the human shepherd, who they follow every day enthusiastically to the paddy fields, where they are allowed to feed. They are also imprinted on each other, and that holds the flock together. The man, of course, is farming them for meat and eggs. Water dissolves limestone. 
On a grand scale, that process creates caves. Cave swiftlets are unusual birds. They nest in total darkness. Like the bats that share this Southeast Asian cave, they find their way into the caves by sound, listening to echoes of their calls bounced back from the limestone. A swiftlet nest of leaves and moss is stuck together with saliva. Here the birds roost and raise their young. Far below the beasts and the birds, a mountain of guano has grown. This vast dune of droppings, mainly from the bats, is the undigested remains of insects, the hard bits, wing cases, legs and so on. It's all food for golden cockroaches and other scavengers of the heap. Swiftlet guano consists of eggshells and feathers and insect bits, nourishment for the caterpillar of a moth. It's a case moth, traveling in a protective jacket of insect fragments sewn together. It's also a relative of the clothes moth in your wardrobe. In its own way, a cave full of animal remains, wool and such. Our ancestors first encountered the moth problem in a cave. Their animal skin clothes no doubt became moth-eaten. Life in any cave depends on food being brought in from outside. Swallows and house martens nest safely on cave walls and the nest is also home to the caterpillar of the case-bearing moth. It needs a case because without it, it might get fed to the chicks. That's better. Now it can clean up the debris in a nest more safely. The chicks shed feathers and an army of moths, mites and tiny beetles are employed on domestic duty. When humans started to live in suitable houses, the birds transferred easily to the eaves and in most cases were welcomed there. The nests, of course, also contained the fleas, moths and mites that found themselves one stop away from entering the giant nest that we call home. Access to our attics breached our defences against the case-bearing moth and the feather mites. And soon there were spider beetles and a host of other nest dwellers at home in our rugs. The bird's nest had become a Trojan horse, smuggling a hungry army into our wardrobe. The damage done by a clothes moth larva is not usually noticed until it's happened and the moth has flown. Just as the larva disguises itself in the bird's nest to avoid being eaten by the bird, so it spins a silk and woolen coat of whatever colors are around and will undercover munch and pollute its way through our expensive clothes. In about six hours, the spinning will be complete and the lava will be invisible unless it's moving. The clothes moth has become an animal out of place, like a weed in a garden. In our nest, it is a most unwelcome guest.
the wolf, pack hunter of the forests of the north. Intelligent, social animals, communicating by sound and body language. They were the ancestors of the dog, whose long partnership with us is unrivaled. Every wolf in a pack knows its place in the social scale. Tails, ears, postures and conflicts settle disputes over rank. A female coming into heat raises tensions among the males. Access to her is strictly controlled. Ineligible subordinate males are firmly put in their place. In the world of humans, the wolf has been tamed, but similar rules of status within our pack still apply. There are many different breeds of dog, most docile and friendly, but they still use their pack language when encountering strangers. Raised tails allow pheromones to signal dominance. A lower tail shuts off that scent and indicates submissiveness. Fights are usually brief, the dominant dog soon making its rank clear. On the island of Bali, each family dog defends its household territory. This puppy is an intruder, but doesn't understand that not everything belongs to him. The family dog is about to make it clear. Slowly, the pup realizes that there are more important dogs around than he is. On the plains of Africa, wild dog pups know their place well in a tightly organized pack. This litter will await the return of the hunters, a pack of non-breeding adult relatives led by a single breeding pair, the parents of the pup. In stalking posture, the leaders single out a young gazelle. They move into action as a team. Cooperation is the secret of their hunting success. What they catch, they will take back to the pups. This youngster is separated from its parent and the pack closes in. This domestic dog is hunting, with a human pack it regards as its own. Their common quarry is wild pig. Grass fires are lit to drive the wild pig out of cover. The dogs help by sniffing out the prey. It's the most ancient human-animal relationship, and the Hagahai people of Papua New Guinea have always hunted this way. The men have their prize, but the dogs cornered the pigs for them and now catch rodents as their reward. The herding of sheep brought man and dog together long ago, one reason being to guard sheep against predators. The wolf in Italy was defeated in its plundering by a domestic relative in disguise. That's a dog. It looks like a sheep. The dog is called a marema. In a way, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. The real wolf is in for a surprise. A ferocious sheep that barks like a dog.
American vultures are not related to the vultures of the old world. They're just shaped to do a similar job. The turkey vulture, common in North and South America, is almost as big as an eagle, soaring over the canopy of this rainforest on wings two meters wide. In Africa, vultures find their food by sight, but carrion is readily visible on grassland. Many animals die in these trees every day, but out of sight, so turkey vultures use their noses. The scent of a newly dead animal is strong enough for the turkey vulture to perceive with its accurate sense of smell. But the turkey vulture may soon be forced off the carcass it's sniffed out by gatecrashers that only have greedy eyes. Needing to eat quickly, they squabble over the dead sloth or monkey fallen on the forest floor. When they've eaten, some will relax and sun themselves. Without the help of those remarkable nostrils, none of these birds would be able to find food at all. A sense of smell is unusual in birds, and for millions of years, its development in turkey vultures was the answer to the difficulty of hunting in the dense forest. When people began to change the world, the turkey vulture's special skill became a very useful talent. Miami, Florida. Like so many North American cities, nature has been rolled under the highways and the real estate. But the turkey vultures are still here in larger numbers than ever before. There's not much forest here, unless you count the downtown high-rise blocks. As good a perch for city vultures as any. There are many mouths to feed here. Obviously, the noses have been a great success. But when the wind is in the right direction, what appetizing smells do they detect? They are on their way to a feast, riding the thermals from the sun-baked parking lots and the updrafts between the skyscrapers. To the turkey vulture, the air must seem to quiver with tantalizing smells, the odor of human refuse. The birds are winging their way to the municipal dump to dine al fresco. Last week's TV dinners, the leftovers of millions, are today's turkey vulture's delight. The nose seems to twitch in anticipation. A first sitting of gulls is leaving for their roost, satisfied. The management is constantly busy, reorganizing the menu, relaying the table for these all-American vultures. These are birds with an ancient nose for opportunity, living in this new world of second-hand fast food.